is going on Solo fam? My name is John Solo, and as you can tell from the background, I moved again. That's right, third time in three years, because if I stay somewhere for more than 10 months, I may literally die. At least that's what the fortune teller told me. Anyway, welcome to Astrology Explained, the show where I break down the significance of various astrological signs, but not the same annoying way they do in Cosmo and on Snapchat. Instead of telling you that you're going to meet an attractive stranger this weekend, or that you should avoid traveling by sea for the next two years, I explore the mythological explanations for how these figures wound up in the sky and the kinds of personalities they supposedly represent. In terms of how I decide which sign to focus on, I keep it pretty simple. Whatever's active for the majority of the month is what I'm talking about. And in June, that's Gemini. For the uninitiated, Gemini is the third sign in the zodiac and is active sometime between May 21st and June 20th, placing it between Taurus and Cancer. The name Gemini is Latin for twins, which is apparently what the symbol is supposed to be. But I swear to God, if any of you tells me that it actually looks like twins, I will burn your house down with all your family heirlooms inside it. Sorry, I went too far. Blame it on Mercury being in retrograde. Speaking of, Mercury, the Roman god for Hermes, not the planet, is said to be the ruler of Gemini. And the reason this is relevant is that Geminis are believed to have a connection with the skilled trades and are associated with hands, the twin instruments of skill and accomplishment. Anyone who's seen my episode on Hermes knows that he also had a reputation for his craftsmanship and musical ability, having invented the lyre. So it makes sense that he'd be associated with Gemini. Another interesting detail about you Geminians, Geminagons, Geminites? If you're a Gemini, then these skills I just mentioned are best exercised and stimulated by having a sparring partner, hence the twin symbol. Now your partner doesn't have to be your twin. It could be a friend, coworker, or even an enemy. The point is that when somebody else gets involved, you get better, whether that's from them helping you practice or your competitive side coming out. Another creative way of interpreting the twin symbol is it may represent the ego and shadow, another Jungian concept like the collective unconscious we talked about with Pisces. You see, the ego always strives to take the conscious path that's found in the individual will or in society at large, while the shadow is the hidden side that represents the values and desires you've repressed or refused to acknowledge. From time to time, the shadow manages to creep out of the darkness in Gemini types, which results in them being perceived as unpredictable, inconsistent, and potentially dangerous. Of course, not all Geminians are like this because human beings are complicated and the idea that you can assess someone's entire personality based on the position of stars a billion miles away is ridiculous ridiculous, but that's the reputation. It's not a great one, but I'm a Scorpio, so you're not gonna get any sympathy from me. Now, an interesting detail when it comes to the Gemini constellation is that other cultures throughout history have had their own identifications for it. Thanks to Greek mythology, we identified the heads of each twin as Pollux and Castor, two figures that we'll talk about in just a minute, but the Babylonians had different names for them. They called the stars Lugalira and Meslam Ta'ia, which mean the mighty king and the one who has arisen from the underworld, respectively. Both titles are epithets of Nergal, a major Babylonian god of plague and pestilence who is also king of the underworld. We don't have enough time to unpack all of his mythology today, but you should know the way he earned his seat on the throne is by assaulting and threatening to murder the queen of the underworld, Oresh Kagal, unless she married him, so he's not a figure to be trifled with. Over in China, the Gemini constellation is replaced by another called Jing Shu, which means well. The two constellations have virtually nothing to do with each other besides occupying the same space, but you can see how the shapes are pretty similar. Now, when it comes to Greek mythology, there are two possible interpretations for which figures Gemini is supposed to represent. The aforementioned Castor and Polydeuces, or Pollux, are by far the most popular option and were referred to as the sons of Zeus, though the nature of their conception makes experts question if they really should be considered twins. See, their mother, Leda, was the queen of Sparta, and Zeus impregnated her while disguised as a swan. Meanwhile, her husband, King Tyndareus, impregnated her a second time that very same day. Pollux and Helen, yes, that Helen, were her twins by Zeus and therefore immortal, while Castor and Clytemnestra were her children by Tyndareus and were mortal. Interestingly, we don't often hear about her female children when talking about Gemini, but that's possibly because Gemini is considered a masculine air sign that's connected to Jungian principles. You may have noticed that in most of the art depicting the constellation, the twins are shown to be young children, which is emblematic of the reckless and intrusive curiosity that's often displayed 
played by adolescent boys. However, that destructive nature is still shown in myths involving Helen and Clytemnestra. Helen's willingness to let herself be brought to Troy led to the most infamous war of all time. Then, when Clytemnestra's husband, King Agamemnon, returned from said war, she killed him. Back to Castor and Pollux, though, they were the closest that two friends and brothers could get and were said to even look like identical twins despite having two different fathers. Castor was a famed horseman and warrior who taught Heracles how to fence, while Pollux was a champion boxer. The myth they're most known for outside of their birth is when they rode with Jason and the Argonauts on their quest for the Golden Fleece, which we actually learn the origins of in our Ares episode. On this journey, they have a particularly infamous interaction with Amicus, the son of Poseidon, who wouldn't let the Argos crew leave Asia Minor unless someone beat him in a boxing match. Pollux, who was sick of this guy's arrogance, accepted the challenge and easily avoided his heavy blows and haymakers before splitting his skull open with a devastating counterpunch. Apollonius, the writer of the Argonautica, which details the quest for the Golden Fleece, also says there were many times on the voyage back home where the Argonauts owed their safety to Castor and Pollux. We aren't told any details, but given the nature of sea travel, we can safely assume that storms were involved, and ever since then, the twins have been the patron saints of sailors. In fact, the phenomenon known as St. Almos Fire, where a glowing blue light appears on pointy objects during storms, like on the masts of ships, was believed to be a sign that the twins were protecting the ship. But as for how Castor and Pollux wound up being a constellation, that actually involved a feud with another set of twins over two beautiful women or cattle, depending on the version. The other pair of twins was named Itis and Lynchaeus, and they also happened to be members of the Argos crew. They were engaged to Phoebe and Hilera, but Castor and Pollux tried carrying the women off for themselves. This culminated in a fight where Lynchaeus impaled Castor with his sword and killed him just before he was killed by a battle-frenzied Pollux. Before Itis could avenge his own brother, though, he was struck by a bolt of lightning from Zeus, who was inclined to protect his children, even if they were in the wrong. After Castor died, the immortal Pollux mourned for his brother and pleaded with his father to give them both immortality. So Zeus placed them in the skies, the constellation Gemini, and from then on, they would never be separated again. I'll be honest, not totally sure they deserve the constellation treatment, but I'm not gonna argue with Zeus. So like I said, the vast majority of people nowadays consider Gemini to be Castor and Pollux, but there was a famous Roman poet named Hyginus who claimed they were actually Apollo and Hercules, hence the twins holding a club as well as a lyre and bow and arrow. And what makes that even more interesting is that Ptolemy, an astronomer who wrote the star catalog where the traditional 48 constellations in Western astronomy are sourced from, also referred to Castor as the star of Apollo and Pollux as the star of Hercules. However, there is only one discovered instance of him calling them that. There's no myth that explains why they'd be up there, not to mention Hercules has his own constellation. And I'm not talking about the one from the Disney movie. Actually, the real Hercules constellation is upside down relative to the constellations near it, which I think would have been hilarious for them to include in the Disney movie. Cause you know, Phil's lifelong dream was for one of his students to be placed among the stars. I would have loved for that tender moment at the end to be ruined by Zeus making the constellation upside down before looking back at Phil and saying, I'm sorry, that's the only way it'll fit. Anyway, I'm firmly in the camp that Gemini represents Castor and Pollux, but I would love to hear your input on that little debate and anything else we talked about today. Do you think I went too far by describing Geminagons as destructive? or do those of you who were born under Gemini completely agree? Let me know in a comment down below. Then if you enjoyed this video and want the remaining seven episodes of the astrology series delivered right to your sub box when they come out, hit those like and subscribe buttons. Also, make sure to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Not only is it the best way to stay updated on what's going on behind the scenes here, but it's a great backup for those occasions when YouTube Subbox says, nah, I don't feel like working today. I'll see you all again soon with even more messed up content. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. Thank you.